Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. I'm Crosby Kemper, the director uh, of the Kansas City Public Library. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have you all here. I'm going to mention a couple of upcoming programs before I introduce John Blundell. And I do, uh, our, both of our uh, programs for May and for June are available uh, outside. And I do want to point out a couple of things uh, for those of you who are here uh, interested in Ladies uh, for Liberty that we have uh, two Ladies for Liberty on the cover of, covers of our May and June programs. Um, oops, sorry. Here we go. Um, and uh, Michelle Ree, uh, the former superintendent of schools in Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, now the head of uh, a reform, uh, an education reform organization called Students First, which will give you an idea of what she's all about, um, will be here talking uh, about her new book, Radical uh, Fighting uh, to Put Students First. Um, and uh, she'll be here on May 22nd. Uh, she'll be at the Plaza Library, and I would encourage you uh, to come to that. Um, and then, of course, on the cover of our June uh, uh, program, I want to point out that Sandra Day O'Connor, most of you will have heard of, uh, 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 first uh, a woman on the United States Supreme Court, um, uh, will be here uh, kicking off uh, a series uh, that we're going to be doing uh, that's really a successor to our, our presidential series, Hail to the Chiefs, our First Ladies uh, series, Beyond the Gowns. Uh, we'll be uh, inaugurating a series on uh, the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, 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 she'll be here on uh, Monday, uh, June 3rd, here at the Central Library. We have a lot of programs, uh, particularly this month, uh, on women. As part of our Beyond the Gown series, uh, we have, uh, of course, just done uh, uh, a program on Lady Bird Johnson with Michael Gillette, uh, the uh, uh, editor and, and, and author of the, the book of her oral history uh, interviews. Um, and uh, coming up on June 5th, we have Cynthia Kerner on Martha Jefferson Randolph, who was not a first lady per se, in that she wasn't a spouse of uh, Thomas Jefferson. He was, she was his daughter, but of course, his wife uh, had died uh, uh, in the 1780s, um, and, uh, and his daughter Martha, took o known as Patsy, took over as first lady in the years in the White House. Um, so uh, we have a, a lot of interesting programs coming up. Oh, and the last one I want to mention, too, is we're inaugurating a series as part of our Cradle of Entrepreneurs series that we've been doing, where I interview uh, prominent entrepreneurs in Kansas City, uh, uh, people who have built their businesses here. We're starting a series with the Central Exchange that is focused primarily on women, women entrepreneurs, well, exclusively, actually, on women. Um, and uh, to kick that off, uh, and showing that we are ideologically balanced, at the Kansas City Public Library. Um, two days from now, on Wednesday, uh, here at the Central Library, I'll be having a conversation with my friend, Roshan Paris. And Roshan uh, Paris Communications is one of our leading public relations firms in Kansas City. It has a national reach. In fact, Roshan has been uh, a key advance person, leading advance person, a director of advance uh, for Hillary Clinton, for Michelle Obama, for the president, for Bill Clinton. Um, she's taken, uh, taken them on trips to places like Uganda uh, and China, uh, et cetera. Uh, she's also worked for the leading companies in Kansas City, for Sprint, uh, for Aquila, uh, uh, for Hallmark, uh, et cetera. She's had a fascinating career, and uh, I, told her, I told her on Friday when I was talking to her about this that I will ask her about Benghazi and she'll give me a stonewalling answer when I ask her about that. Um, but we, it, it, it does display our ideological uh, complexity here at the Kansas City Public Library. But tonight, we have John Blundell. And John Blundell uh, is a hero of mine because he is, has been involved uh, over, over the years uh, with an organization, uh, a lot of different organizations, but an organization called the Institute for Economic Affairs. Um, and the Institute for Economic Affairs is not well known here. It's a London-based organization, but it basically inaugurated what will be known in the future as the era of think tanks uh, in the United States and in, in the English-speaking uh, world. Uh, the Institute for Economic Affairs, uh, based on the ideas of the economist Friedrich Hayek, uh, <clears throat> had a huge influence on an important person in our world who just passed away, Margaret Thatcher. It also, uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher, who, who's, uh, whose funeral John attended uh, recently, um, where he was, by the way, just as an entire, entire digression with Julian Fellows, uh, and can, he will be able to tell you in the question and answer section about the fourth season of Downton Abbey. Um, 
what, a, what actually happens. Uh, but the influence of the Institute of Economic Affairs on Margaret Thatcher and beyond Margaret Thatcher uh, on the Western world generally, on, on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the belief in, fr in the importance of free markets uh, has been enormous. And, and uh, John Blundell uh, has been the Director General of the Institute uh, uh, of Economic Affairs. Um, he's also been the president of the Institute of Humane Studies, the IHS, here in the United States, a uh, similar organization that's been involved in the education uh, around uh, conservative ideas, free market ideas, um, uh, uh, the ideas of Western civilization as I, I would view them. Um, he has lots of other uh, involvements, the Institute for Justice, uh, the Institute for Children, of which he founded. Um, and. Uh, He's written a book on Margaret Thatcher, uh, biographical treatment of Margaret Thatcher, uh, and important for us tonight, he has written this book, Ladies for Liberty, Liberty Women Who Made a Difference in American History. Um, and this book goes from, from, uh, from Anne Hutchison, uh, who uh, defied the, uh, the, the patriarchal uh, Puritans uh, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony to, uh, uh, to promote a, a view of uh, the independent uh, moral worth of women and indeed of every, uh, every individual soul uh, on, onto the, the, uh, uh, the, the wonderful life of, of someone whose career really started in the state of Missouri, Madam C.J. Walker, one of my, uh, my personal heroes who, uh, when she died, an African-American woman uh, dying in, I think, the 1920s or late teens, uh, died as the wealthiest uh, self-made woman in the world, the first millionaire woman under her own steam. Uh, in, in the world w with an invention, a hair care product that, sh that was invented uh, by her and a colleague uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, um, uh, and who said, I like this, this quote from uh, Madam C.J. Walker, and I'll, with, with this quote, I'll turn it over uh, to John Blundell, um, if I can find it. She said, I got my start from giving myself a start, a lesson to all individuals. Anyway, I'm happy to give John Blundell his start. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, wonderful to be here in uh, a city that I always think of as uh, Paris on the Plain. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to dinner later this evening uh, to see if uh, you measure up to uh, what I could be enjoying tonight in Paris. Um, I've been given 30 minutes, and what I thought I'd do is spend roughly the first, um, first few minutes talking about um, Margaret Thatcher, because she just passed away, and um, I was at the funeral. Of course, Meryl Streep won the Oscar uh, last year uh, for her, her portrayal of, of, um, of, of Lady T, as, as, as we called her. Um, and then I'll explain how that book, writing that biography of uh, Margaret, Lady T, um, which is here, uh, led me to write uh, my book, Ladies for Liberty. I think we forget how awful things were in England when um, she became prime minister in the spring of 1979. Um, we'd had double digit inflation uh, for over six years, at times reaching 30% per annum. Uh, and if your salary didn't double every two and a half years, you were falling behind. Um, the unions were running rampant. Uh, there were pickets all over the place. Um, three, I think three things really stand out in my memory. Firstly, uh, ambulances were not responding to 911 calls. You can imagine living in a society where ambulances don't respond to an emergency call. Um, the trash men were on strike. So on every street corner, there were just mountains, 30, 40 foot high, of, of trash bags. And the grave diggers were on strike. So dead bodies and coffins were, were piling up at uh, disused factories. That was the state of Britain that, uh, uh, that she um, inherited. Uh, what did she do? Well, she did many, many things. And I summarize in my uh, bi biography, uh, ten of the um, uh, most uh, important things she did. Firstly, she brought the whole trade union movement uh, back under the rule of law. And that gave its leadership, took the leadership of the trade union movement away from the extremists 
uh, and gave it back to the moderate ordinary members. Second, she transformed how the nation viewed the benefits of a free market economy. Thirdly, she privatised the commanding heights. All those companies, British Airways, British Petroleum, British Steel, they started British and meant it was owned by the government. Um, and they were all making gargantuan losses, uh, sucking up enormous amounts of subsidy every year. And she privatised them. She turned them into world-class, nimble companies that instead of guzzling up subsidies, started suddenly paying taxes. She taught us the need for monetary continence if we wish to control inflation. She enfranchised millions of people who were effectively local city serfs in that their landlord was a city. They were living in public housing units and um, they had no control over their accommodation. Um, the, the government even decided what colour the front door had to be painted. And uh, she gave those millions of people uh, the right to buy at their own homes at half price. And about three million did. Uh, she made Brits uh, walk tall again with a strong, principled, uh, rule of law based approach to foreign relations. She cut marginal taxes and she handled the, the debt and the deficit. Uh, the, the fame drain, that is the drain of famous people out of the country, and the brain drain, that is the drain of clever people out of the country, both stopped and reversed. When she cut tax rates, people started coming back. I can remember her at a drinks party at number 10, up on the uh, second floor, or what you would call the first floor. Um, uh, Michael Caine, the movie actor, at a drinks party at number 10. And uh, Margaret uh, grabbing his elbow and taking him around the room and saying to folks, uh, this is Michael, you know, like he needed any introduction. <laughs> this is Michael, he came back. Um, she was very proud of that. Uh, she started the process uh, that led to peace in Northern Ireland and working with the Pope and the President, President Ronald Reagan, um, she um, uh, helped tear down that wall and destroy the evil empire without a shot being fired. And she um, ensured that all future British governments would have to pay uh, much more attention to the benefits of a market-based economy uh, than had previously been the case in the previous, say, 40 years. What happened? We, we jumped from 19th to 2nd in the OECD ladder. We became a nation of entrepreneurs. Self-employment doubled from 7% to 14%. Um, when Margaret came to power in 1979, we had no venture capital industry at all. Six years later, our venture capital industry was twice the entire venture capital industry on the European continent. So add up no, 55 countries in Europe, uh, our venture capital industry went from zero to being twice. Uh, we, um, the number of people who called themselves middle class jumped from 33% to 50%. Uh, public um, uh, owning your own home uh, jumped from 53% to 71%. And owning shares became very popular. Owning shares became so popular that the newspapers and the radio and TV companies had to ask, add business correspondence. Um, uh, the number of people who owned, directly owned shares, not through your pension fund, but directly selected a company and bought shares, went from 5% of the adult population uh, to 30%. Uh, membership of trade unions plummeted from over 50% to less than 20%. Uh, the number of days lost to strikes plummeted from over 30 million uh, to less than half a million. And those half a million were in just one um, industry. Can any, anybody guess which industry would still... No, the coal no longer existed, sir. <laughs> the post office, which she failed to privatise because um, the rumour was that um, the Queen... because. Prime Minister meets with the Queen for an hour every week. And the Queen had said um, she wasn't too keen on the idea of privatising the post office because she was afraid her, her image wouldn't appear on every stamp <laughs> once it was privatised. Um, and and, and, and the, the market is taking care of the post office. The post office is, it is going, uh, just as it is in this country, um, going from, from bad to worse and going down the tubes and, and private enterprises is, is, taking care of, and take, is taking care of that job for us. So um, 
I did, as your chairman um, uh, mentioned, I did attend um, as a guest of the family, um, um, Margaret, the Lady T's um, funeral service last month in, in St. Paul's Cathedral, and I would be more than happy to answer questions in the Q&A uh, about that uh, service, about that day, uh, and also about the movie, because I know many of you have probably seen the movie uh, with Meryl Streep, and I know that some of you have probably got questions a, a, about that. And your chairman was quite right, Julian Fellows was there, sitting a couple of rows in front of me uh, in, St. in St. Paul's Cathedral on um, that, that, Wednesday, um, that Wednesday morning, three or four weeks ago now. Uh, but it was my Margaret Thatcher book that actually led me to write the book I'm here to talk about tonight, Ladies for Liberty, Women Who Made a Difference in American History. Because when my Margaret Thatcher biography came out, and it's now out in um, America, Poland, Romania, and China, um, I got a lot of speaking engagements. And I would come home, uh, we lived just north of Tampa in Florida, um, uh, a bit disgruntled um, because uh, the second or third question from the floor was always, um, why haven't we had more Margaret Thatchers in our history? I'd be like dumbfounded by this question. I'd say, well, you know, American history it might be very brief. I mean, we've got about 40,000 years of history. You've got about 400 years. Um, <laughs> But, but American history is stuffed with great women. And I would start rattling off a few names, and everybody would know, you know Martha Washington and Abigail Adams, and more recently, say, Ayn Rand, uh, names like that. Uh, but um, once I got into names such as, um, well, the name that our, our chairman mentioned, Madam C.J. Walker, um, who um, really got her start um, here in this state, um, name recognition went into the cellar. And one evening um, at a Chinese takeout with my then 19-year-old, now 23-year-old, uh, James, um, I must have been boring him somewhat because he said, uh, Dad, he said, for heaven's sake, he said, shut up, stop being so boring and write a book about all these women. <laughs> yeah, if it's such a big deal for you to come back off these speaking tours and find, um, um, and so, so here it is, um, ladies for liberty. <laughs> Um, Women Who Made a Difference in American History, the second expanded edition, just out last month, uh, where I added five more chapters to the first edition. Um, let me just briefly tell you um, how, um, what I looked for in choosing them, and then I'll say perhaps one thing about each of the 25. Um, they had to be a really good, enduring story to begin with. Uh, so Molly Pitcher and Betty Zane do not appear I mean, they were brave for 15 minutes, and that was about it, if Molly Pitcher even existed, which I frankly doubt. Um, these are women like Katie Stanton, who was at it for 50 years. Uh, they made a, a prodigious uh, long-term commitment to liberty. Uh, they had to be a range of stories uh, by states, uh, by a type of endeavor. I couldn't just have Western novelists or suffragettes or abolitionists. I wanted a range of stories, and um, like I said, they had to be very strong, very dramatic stories uh, to make it. So who are my 25? I, I start with um, Anne Hutchinson, uh, Anne Marbury Hutchinson, uh, born in the same county as Margaret Thatcher. Uh, in fact, the county of Lincolnshire. Um, my book starts with, um, after all the sort of pre-material, if America has a founding mother, then Anne Marbury Hutchinson has foremost claim to the title. Uh, she moved with her family from Lincolnshire to, um, to the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony um, in, in search of religious freedom. Uh, she found it a very um, heavy-handed uh, administration there, very um, uh, uh, male-dominated, top-down uh, kind of society, and she rebelled. And in the end, she was... Uh, taken to court twice, and she and her followers, who were mostly self-employed tradesmen and farmers, they weren't military types or bureaucrats or, 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 or government types, uh, and she had quite a following, uh, they were expelled. And they walked six hours, six days south uh, and co-founded uh, Rhode Island. She's the only woman to have co-founded, founded or co-founded a state. Um, and she's there introduced many of the very Jeffersonian kind of ideas that she had. And this is in the 1630s and 40s. 
I mean, Jefferson wasn't even around. I mean, this is 100 years before Jefferson got going. Um, um, th 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 that was... Um, incidentally, uh, Mr. Chairman, I was very interested that you, you said that Jefferson's um, first lady is going to be the subject of a, a lecture. I thought his first lady was um, Dolly Madison, but uh, you've obviously corrected me. Thank you. Um, Yes, but I think Madison was the vice president. And I, I'd always thought, I, I must be wrong, I'd always thought that Dolly Madison was, was Thomas Jefferson. So anyway, um, that's just a by the by. Um, uh, so so Anne, Anne Hutchinson, I, I think, is, and there's a statue of her in Boston, and I think she's um, a, a real gem. My second chapter concerns Mercy Otis Warren. She was known as the conscience of the American Revolution because after the Revolution she wrote a history, the first woman to write a history of the United States. And it's still available today. It's published in two volumes by Liberty Press in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, Mercy Otis Warren. And she did three things uh, as well. Well, she wrote the history after the Revolution. But before the Revolution, she uh, attacked the British she satirized them in, uh, and savaged them with her poems and her plays uh, and, and really did um, cheer up the, the patriots no end. Uh, these were all published anonymously because, of course, you know, no man would read a poem or a play if it was written by a woman back then. I mean, heaven, heaven forbid. Uh, although we, we do know some of the leading lights of the revolution knew that she, like John Adams, knew, knew what she was up to. Um, but mo most importantly of all, I think, Unlike Al Gore, she actually did invent the email of the day. Um, she and her husband and two friends uh, conceived the idea of the committees of correspondence in her front room at her home in Massachusetts. And within a year, all 318 major towns in the 13 colonies had a committee of correspondence and were in touch with each other, sharing uh, news and intelligence and information. Martha Washington is in my book for one reason, one reason only. She ran George Washington's winter camps year after year after year. She traveled across country, uh, ran his camp, kept him there, which kept the officers there, which kept the troops there. If she hadn't done that, he'd have come home, the officers would have gone home, the troops would have gone home, and they'd have probably been late in the spring, and the Brits would have run all over you. Abigail Adams, again, very well known. And she did a bit of everything. I mean, she was a prodigious letter writer to her husband, John Adams, the second um, president. Uh, she was the first woman to be um, a wife of a president and mother. Uh, John Quincy Adams, of course, the sixth president, was one of her children, until Mrs. Bush came along, the only woman to do that. And um, she was very principled, and she was very outspoken. She once said to John Adams, I, I feel much better able to advise you by letter than to your face. Uh, she never owned a slave on principle. Uh, she taught black children to read and write when it was probably illegal. I know it was illegal in many states. I'm not quite sure if it was illegal in Massachusetts, but it was Ill illegal in most places. Um, she melted her pots and pans for bullets. She let the militia train on her, uh, on her farmland. She ran the family business for the years that her, her husband was away. Uh, in um, Philadelphia and then in New York and in, in Washington and in, in Europe. And um, she took young John Quincy Adams to watch the Battle of Bunker Hill when he was eight years old. Come on, let's go watch the battle today. <laughs> and um, uh, although the Brits won, the, the Brits paid a terrible price. I think the Brits lost something like 500 uh, troops and the Americans lost about 100. Uh, so the Brits won, but a, a huge price, and John Quincy was there watching with his mom. The Grimpke sisters, they were terrific uh, campaigners uh, for abolition. Uh, they were born, they were Southern royalty, born in Charleston, South Carolina. Their, their family trees are littered with um, wealthy traders, governors, uh, aides to George Washington. I mean, you name it, it's, it's on their family tree. And they could have lived a life of luxury. But they ab abhorred slavery, and they moved north, first to Philadelphia, then to New York, then to Boston, and, and were two of the, the biggest uh, campaigners uh, for, for abolition. Harriet Beecher Stowe, of course, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, when Lincoln met 
her. Uh, he's meant to have said, um, so you're the little lady that caused my great war. And her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, was the second best-selling book of that century. Only the Bible sold more copies. Um, it was an astonishing uh, success. The little girl in the book, I think it's called, um, is it Eva? Eva. Yeah, Eva. And in Boston alone, the year after the book was published, something like 400 baby girls were called Eva. <laughs> so if you're doing your family tree and you find an Eva born in the 1850s, you know what your great-great-granny was reading um, <laughs> and why she, she, she did that. Uh, people in the South were appalled by uh, this book. Um, a, a minister in Maryland was sent to jail for 10 years for owning a copy. And people in the South cut body parts off their slaves and mailed them to her uh, as, as a sign of their um, displeasure. Um, her, her sisters rallied around and intercepted her mail and dealt with all that. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, a great campaigner, plumb line. I, I put her in rather than Susan B. Anthony. I think Susan B. Anthony gets too much credit and Elizabeth Cady Stanton doesn't get enough credit. Uh, and so I, I, I couldn't have both in, so I, I put uh, Katie Stanton in. Wrote the Seneca Falls Declaration of, of, uh, of Women's Rights, which is a glorious document, and campaigned on every issue for over 50 years. I mean, until the day before, the day before she died, she was writing a letter to the president's wife, uh, extolling the uh, idea of uh, votes for women. Clara Barton, of course, invented the American Red Cross. Um, she, she didn't know the Red Cross existed. Uh, during the Civil War, she, would, um, she was in Washington, D.C., and she would regularly liter literally steal supplies from government warehouses to get them to the front. She literally liberated government supplies that were locked up in warehouses and got them to the battles out there in Virginia and Maryland. And it was only after the war when she collapsed from exhaustion and her doctor said, take a holiday to Europe, that she got to Switzerland and her fame had spread and the Red Cross, which was based in Geneva, sought her out and said, well, we're the Red Cross. Um, why won't America sign the treaty and, and join up? And she came back, she lobbied Congress, she got America to sign up and she created the, the American Red Cross, which of course does so, so much good work and is all constantly in the news. Uh, she never took any government money. She stole from the government. <laughs> but she didn't get the government to steal from you and me. Um, Harriet Tubman, uh, she ran the Underground Railroad. And as she once famously said, uh, my train never left the track and I never lost a passenger. And she would, um, she'd escaped from the South, had gotten as far as Philadelphia, where for 10 months a year she worked in some, you know, as a maid or a cook or a cleaning lady or whatever. Uh, but then early December every year would take off back down to the south. And she chose December and January to, to run her underground railroad for two reasons. One, the nights were longer. And of course, they always traveled at night in the dark so people couldn't see these people wearing <coughs> slave clothes. Um, and the second reason she did was that um, the tradition in the south was that if, 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 if a farm um, had had a bad year, um, then the time to sell off a slave or two uh, and possibly if you're in, in Maryland, you're not being treated too badly, but you might get sold off and shipped down to Alabama or, or somewhere like that where you, you could expect to be treated much badly, more badly. Um, so uh, the, the, the auctions for slaves were between Christmas Day and New Year's Day. And so the propensity of the slaves to flee, to take the very dangerous job of fleeing because the, 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 the rewards would be put out, and there were bounty hunters on the border uh, with uh, Pennsylvania uh, waiting to catch these people and uh, take them back for $100, $50, $200 bounties. Um, so the propensity to flee was highest just around Christmas time. Uh, and, and that was when she would run her Underground Railroad uh, from deep into Maryland uh, up uh, into uh, Pennsylvania. And then when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, she did getting to... Pennsylvania wasn't far enough. You had, she had to get them to Canada. Um, and she did that every winter for, for, for a good decade or more. Uh, Bina West Miller. Anybody here from Michigan? Oh, okay. 
Um, anybody heard of Bina West? Bina West Miller? That's terrible. <laughs> she invented life insurance for women. She was a school teacher. And back in the day, uh, in the 1880s, uh, if, if the woman died, the man had two choices. He either put the kids up for adoption pretty darn quickly, or he remarried pretty darn quickly, like within two or three weeks, probably, um, because he got no insurance check. If the man died, the woman got a check from his working men's association or his benefit association, or one of those kind of things that he was, everybody was a member of back then. Um, and Bina had two great kids at school, a, a boy and a girl, and one day she heard the mother had died, the next day she heard the kids had been put up for adoption, and the next day she heard that the girl had been sent out to work as a maid and the boy to, sent out to clean out stables. So education was over. And she thought, this is dreadful. And she resigned as a teacher, and she set about popularizing the notion of, of life insurance for women. And within several years, she had hundreds of thousands of women uh, in, in, insured. Our chairman mentioned uh, Madam C.J. Walker, the first woman on earth to make a million dollars without a husband or without an inheritance or without a government rigging a market for her. She made it purely on her own uh, efforts. Uh, she invented um, uh, hair care products for black women. But more importantly, she empowered 8,000 black women as, as her agents throughout the United States um, who ended up making six times what they would be making as kitchen maids or washerwomen or cooks or whatever. And um, when she trained them, uh, she gave them lessons in free market economics and entrepreneurship. She didn't just say, here's the product. She actually explained to them at the end of every lecture who her favorite entrepreneurs were in American, in American history. And she died um, soon after World War I and um, was the wealthiest woman in, in the world, basically. Um, Laura Ingalls Wilder, Rose Wilder Lane. Uh, Laura, Ingalls Wild, Laura Ingalls Wilder's Notes, which we now know R Rose Wilder Lane turned into the books. Uh, Little House on the Prairie, ten books. Uh, Ronald Reagan's favorite uh, TV program. Um, and is still on TV to this day. And the, con the future contracts that have been signed uh, take that way out. I mean, it's going to be on TV probably when I'm, I'm, I'm long gone. Alice Paul was the mother of the uh, 19th uh, Amendment. Um, she um, was trained in England. She was from um, the East Coast. She went to England on a scholarship and fell under the spell of the suffragettes there uh, and, and came back and applied some of their tactics here in this country. Um, do any of you know the difference between a suffragette and a suffragist. Well, back, back, uh, back in the 19, um, say in 1914, I picked that date randomly, um, if you were planning a dinner party and you knew, you knew that uh, this lady here, for example, in the front row was a suffragist, uh, you would invite her. And she'd be polite and well behaved. And uh, if the topic came up, she would express her opinion quietly and firmly. Uh, but, but that would be it. If, on the other hand, this other lady sitting here was a suffragette, uh, then she could be expected to bore everybody silly all night, not keep talking about it, and probably on the way home would throw a brick through a government window uh, and put a petrol bomb in the, in the post office uh, uh, where, where the mail is being... Uh, uh, so, so that's the difference between a suffragette and a suffragist. And Alice Paul was a suffragette. Um, and um, she was the one who um, basically said, uh, if, if, you can't, um, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Uh, and, when you do the, and when you do the time, you go on hunger strike. I mean, she was one tough cookie. Uh, Isabel Patterson was a great author, writer, novelist, uh, book reviewer. Uh, but she's in my book because she educated Ayn Rand. She told Rand to to keep her novels timeless, which is one reason why 60, 50 years later, they're still selling hundreds of thousands of copies a year. And in a late night t telephone call, um, she gave uh, Rand the idea for Atlas Shrugged, 
of the best and brightest minds in society effectively going on strike. Lila Wallace, uh, she and her husband um, co-founded Reader's Digest. She raised the venture capital, she devised the marketing, she ran the human resources side, uh, she did an awful lot. And um, when many people, and some of the youngsters in this room might think, well, Reader's Digest, what's so important about Reader's Digest? Well, it's not very important today, frankly, is it? It's all about what pop stars and diets and so on. But back in the 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s, the Reader's Digest was extremely well-read, extremely serious magazine of ideas. Um, if, you, if you go on eBay, you can buy old copies, which I do occasionally. And I'm, I'm staggered at how good they are and what a good product that is. And it's, it's perhaps no surprise to know that uh, large parts of Reader's Digest are now in receivership. Um, Vivian Kellams was a Connecticut manufacturer who um, objected to withholding. Withholding was introduced into the tax system during World War II as a temporary wartime measure. And she went along with it. But after the war, she waited a couple of years, and when the government didn't repeal it, having promised they would, um, she realized that her staff no longer realized how much tax they were paying, and that her staff no longer followed politics as, as closely as they used to. And so she um, challenged the IRS. She, she stopped withholding. And she got all of her staff to set up bank accounts. Many of them didn't have bank accounts. And they, every week, dutifully, at Friday, when they got paid, they went down to the bank and they paid into their savings accounts the amount of tax that was due every quarter. And um, not a single penny went missing. The IRS admitted when they prosecuted her, they got every penny they were entitled to, but she still uh, had done wrong. And they basically fought to a, a bloody draw. But she was a great icon uh, to the tax protest movement. And she found during the two years that she didn't withhold tax from her employees that suddenly they were coming to say, are we really paying this much tax? And they suddenly started reading the newspaper at lunchtime to, to sort of keep up with public affairs. And they suddenly started voting more uh, because they, 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 they realized what was going on. Taylor Caldwell. Anybody here grew up reading Taylor Caldwell? Lady there, gentleman, two, three, four. She wrote a blockbuster every year for, for, from the mid 40s to the mid 80s. Uh, every year she wrote a blockbuster novel. Uh, her novels were so big that even though every single one of them was optioned by Hollywood, no movie was ever made. They were too big for Hollywood. In fact, her, her novels created the TV miniseries. And two of the first three miniseries on TV back in the 1970s were, were based on Taylor Caldwell's um, novels. I'll give you a, one sentence from one of them just to give you a, a flavor. This is from A Pillar of Iron in 1965 which is um, about ancient Rome. Antonius heartily agreed with Cicero that the budget should be balanced, that the treasury should be refilled, that the public debt should be reduced, that the arrogance of the generals should be tempered and controlled, that assistance to foreign lands should be curtailed, lest Rome become bankrupt, that the mobs should be forced to work and not depend on government for subsistence, and that prudence and frugality should be put into practice as soon as possible. Um, astonishing. That was in a novel. Um, and she had um, huge influence. Claire Booth Luce um, did everything. I mean, she was a writer, an editor, a novelist, a film writer, a spy, a diplomat. She advised Eisenhower. Um, she was the first woman in American history to be a senior diplomat. Um, Eisenhower sent her to Rome uh, as his ambassador, where she promptly took on the uh, com communist trade unions uh, in Italy. Um, and she was, of course, married to Luce, the great um, Henry Luce? Yeah, publisher, yeah, publisher of Time Life, but the great publisher, uh, Luce, who um, uh, they formed a great partnership. Ayn Rand is chapter 20. Uh, when, America, uh, when the American economy tanked in uh, 2008, uh, Rand's two great novels, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, were still selling 100,000 copies a year each. And when the economy went south, 
What did America turn to? Did it turn to its Econ 101 text? No, it turned to Rand. And the sales of her novels jumped up by about half a million copies a year each to about 600,000. Um, Rose Friedman was the wife. She was an economist, author, and political activist. And she was the wife of Milton Friedman, who won the Nobel Prize in 1976. And when he um, got the Nobel Prize in 1976 for economics, uh, Rose was asked by the press, um, how much credit do you think you deserve? And she, she replied, well, I've always thought I deserve at least, uh, uh, well, at least half the credit for everything he's achieved. <laughs> and the more I read about Rose, who um, uh, I, I actually had the pleasure of meeting on many occasions, uh, the more I came uh, to, believe, to believe that. Uh, Rosa Parks is in my book. Um, I don't think I need to say anything about her. I think you're all probably pretty familiar with her story, although I did un uncover some, I thought, some nice twists. Uh, the bus, uh, the bus on which she made her historic stand. Um, a few years after she made her historic stand, and of course Nelson Mandela, the uh, recently president of South Africa, uh, once famously said, uh, before King, there was Parks. And um, she, she was quite senior to him back in the day. Um, she... Um, that, that bus, uh, about three years later, um, the um, bus company told two of its um, uh, mechanics to just take it and, and drop it in a nearby river. Back in those not very environmentally conscious days, that was how they got rid of their used buses. They dropped them in the river. Uh, but the, a police uh, sergeant had said um, to these mechanics, you know, next time you've got a bus that you want to get rid of, let me have it because I've got a small holding outside of town and I could just use a bus to store hay and bits and th things. And, and for 40 years, he, he, he stored his hay and his bits and pieces. And, and when he died, um, the, uh, his uh, children um, kn knew the story of this bus. And they put it on the uh, up for auction. And a museum near Detroit uh, bought it for half a million dollars. And it, it's there to this day as a major attraction. My final three ladies are Jane Jacobs, who wrote, I think, one of the best public policy books ever written. It was called The Death and Life of great American cities. And she single-handedly basically stopped New York City from being Los Angeles. Um, her explanation of what makes a great city, how cities tick, how they work, um, stopped um, all kinds of uh, projects that put all kinds of highways all over Manhattan that would have destroyed tens and tens, hundreds of thousands of businesses, uh, homes and, and churches. And um, she was terrific. And I finish with Dorian Fisher, who was a great uh, philanthropist. And finally, um, Mildred Loving. Anybody know the name Mildred Loving? Gosh. Loving versus Virginia? That's right, interracial marriage. Um, Mildred Jetta was a young black woman in Central Point, Virginia, who had the temerity to fall in love with a white man, Richard Loving. And uh, they, 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 they drove up to Washington, D.C., uh, looked for the name of a minister in a phone book, uh, went and knocked on his door and got married and drove back. And they were promptly arrested because in uh, the late 50s, early 60s, in 17 states, uh, basically from Maryland, sort of in a curve down to Texas, anything below that, um, those 17 states, interracial marriage was illegal. And um, she was arrested, she was fined, uh, she was imprisoned, uh, fined, and then she was banished with her husband from the Commonwealth of Virginia for 25 years on penalty that if she moved back, she could come and visit her mother on her own and he could come and visit his mother on his own, but they couldn't come back as a couple. Um, and, and, um, and if they did, they would both go to jail for five years. So she wrote to Bobby Kennedy and said, um, this, this new bill you're putting through, is this going to help me? And um, he said no, um, but referred her to a lawyer, and uh, the lawyer took the case uh, and took it all away 
um, to the uh, Supreme Court and won. And uh, that ban on interracial marriages was, was eliminated in s the 17 states. It took quite a fight, just because the Supreme Court says you can't do X, um, doesn't mean that all the states um, fall into line. The army, for example, uh, employed a full-time senior uh, JAG officer just to fly around the South, because many of these interracial marriages were you know, between a, a boy and girl meeting in the army or at a dance in a town near an army base. And um, so for about three or four years, the army had one man full time doing nothing but fly around uh, telling the, uh, the clerks of the court or whoever had refused to marry um, um, person A to person B uh, what, the, what the new law was. So those are my 25 uh, Ladies for Liberty. As I said earlier, I'd be happy to take questions about uh, Margaret Thatcher, about the funeral, about the movie, or about any of the ladies uh, in, in my book. And thank you for your attention.